So, when I covered 40k first, I knew I was going to be rolling the dice somewhat. Pun very much intended on that one, but I didn't think that I would get the absolutely phenomenal reception that I got with that video that I published previously, so thank you so much for that. Before we jump into our topic today, I wanted to go ahead and just leave a few notes on this video. Sorry to extend it, but I thought these were relatively important for the topic at hand. The first of which is that, well, it's something that a lot of you correctly pointed out, but which I never mentioned in the last video. It's that 40k's narrative is deliberately left ambiguous at times, and in some places has a lot of unreliable narration. This is a crucial thing to understand about the story and universe of Warhammer 40k, and whilst some things are provable as canon, a lot of things can be left up to interpretation and are shown only through one perspective. The actual way that events unfold will differ according to how they're perceived. Sometimes there are even outright lies just sprinkled in with it all. This makes some of the canon of 40k a lot more malleable than some other fictional universes, though there are most definitely some things that are set in stone, from the fall of Cadia to the burning of Prospero. Yeah, we'll talk about a bunch of those in this video. Speaking of which, there were some things that I got wrong in my last video, and as a relative newcomer to the content scene of 40k, I may have been following the game casually for decades, but I can still absolutely make mistakes. So if you do spot errors, go ahead and point them out. As a newcomer to the content scene of 40k generally, I'm very much building upon the shoulders of giants, and as a human being I just get stuff wrong. This isn't like my other Destiny content, where I've been actively scouring the game for 10 years. So, if you see something that is wrong, please go ahead and point it out in the comments section, I do not mind whatsoever. My objective is to inform. With that being said, we're going to talk a little bit more about one of the key elements that you find within Space Marine 2 today, and that is, of course, the forces of chaos. I covered the basics of chaos in my primer video, but for today, we're going to delve down into the madness. A lot of you were sitting there and expecting me to immediately start making 10 hour long lore videos, and whilst that is certainly possible with 40k's lore, I think we need to start looking at principal topics that are relevant to Space Marine 2 in particular. And the reason for that is because, well, a lot of people are just getting introduced to 40k because of Space Marine 2, so we might as well talk about the elements of the game that are immediately relevant and immediately present that you can see and that you might understand. Going over every traitor legion and every primarch might happen at some point and some day, but for the moment I really want to try and retain some focus on the game because it is the introductory point for a lot of people. That being said, I don't think it's really helpful for me to immediately start talking about the Chaos Space Marines that we face in-game without giving you an underlying thread or so of knowledge. I say thread, really I mean more of a framework, because here's the thing. I could sit there and say that the Chaos Space Marines that you fight in the campaign and in the operations of Space Marine 2 are the Thousand Sons of Magnus the Red, who are closely aligned with Seench. And to everyone who knows 40k and reads up on the lore and plays the tabletop, you'll understand what all that means, but to newcomers, that sounds like I've just talked a total load of gibberish. Not too out of character for those who worship Zinch, but that's beside the point. With that in mind, I'm going to try and cover some ground that we already talked about in the primer today, but I wanted to focus on big topics that I would consider to be required as baseline knowledge for all of Chaos and, well, everything about it. So with that in mind, we're going to cover a lot of things. The Four Gods of Chaos, The Great Game, The Eye of Terror, The Imperial Truth, how it affected the word bearers and Lorgar, the fall of Horus to Chaos thanks to Erebus, the Drop Site Massacre, Magnus's Folly, the Burning of Prospero, the Defeat of Horus at the Siege of Terror, the Aftermath of the Heresy, and then, at last to finish the video, we'll talk about the Thousand Sons. There will be a few other topics sprinkled in there, but even with that, veterans will know that there are so many details that I'm going to have to miss out for the sake of time, and that's already considering that this video is... Oh god, when I wrote the script of this I thought I'd get away with five, six, seven, eight pages. It's 22 pages long. I don't know how long that is in video terms, but it's long. And even with that, there are going to be stories that I just don't get to cover. The fall of Cadia and the creation of the Great Rift, 
They're definitely going to stand out there, but there are also dozens of other stories concerning the individual legions that won't get covered. But for the moment I want to get everyone who watches my videos to a comfortable baseline where they can talk about what you see in Space Marine 2 and keep up with everything. So let's dive into the madness and talk about the four great powers themselves. The four gods of chaos. I already touched on the four gods of chaos in my last video, but I don't think there's enough that can ever be said about them. One small thing at the very beginning as well, which is not in my script, but it should be noted that whilst there are four main gods of chaos, there are lesser chaos entities and lesser chaos gods within the warp. If you're looking at the realm of Warhammer fantasy, you are looking at entities like Hashut. I think it's also worth remembering that there's been the constant issue of the Sons of Malice and Malal for god knows how many years. Point being, whilst I'm going to talk predominantly about the four Chaos Gods, know that the warp is full of entities, and whilst these are most certainly going to come up in some stories, they will have nowhere near as much relevance as the four major Gods of Chaos, who I think it is quite probably accurate to say are the most important characters in all of Warhammer, save for perhaps the Emperor of Mankind. They not only appear in every edition of Warhammer, but also every iteration of it, be that Warhammer Fantasy or Age of Sigma or just Warhammer 40k as we're covering right now. You might have seen me use some footage in my last video of some massive demons from Korn and Zinch, and yeah, that footage is taken from Total War Warhammer 3. It's a Warhammer game, but it's the Warhammer Fantasy IP as opposed to the Warhammer 40k one. But the nice thing is that the Gods of Chaos are consistent throughout both properties. Korn, Zinch, Nurgle, and Slanesh appear in both, even if there are slightly different narrative beats to it. There have been many hints at the idea that these two universes cross over, but the major point is that a lot of the stuff thematically for the Four Gods is consistent through both universes. You'll see the same kind of major and minor demons, the gods are responsible for the same domains such as War for Corn and Plague for Nurgle. There are a lot of differences from the characters involved in each setting to the level of technology or lack thereof as it might be in fantasy, but the broadest strokes are somewhat transferable from property to property. You get what Korn is about in one, and you can be damn sure you're going to get what he's about in the other. But as I said, there are four major gods of chaos, and if you want to know each of them, it helps to understand what each of them represents and each of their domains. It's also worth remembering that despite most of the chaos gods representing certain negative aspects, such as hate or pain, they also have positive aspects or neutral aspects to them. All emotion feeds the warp and empowers one chaos god or another. It's also worth remembering that whilst I'm referring to some of these gods with genders such as Korn and Nurgle, they're all technically psychic beings of the warp that have no single true body and who transcend mortal concepts like this. It's a little bit like talking about an eldritch god from Lovecraftian horror in the sense that it's easier to describe them as they or it rather than assigning he or her to them. In fact, the gods openly play with this concept generally. The god of Slanesh openly toes the line on such classifications of gender. Flaunting it is kind of their thing. But we'll get there when we get there and um, prepare the demonetization sticker. Probably the best known of the chaos gods is Korn, the blood god. He is the chaos god of blood, but he is also the god of war, murder, conflict, hatred, courage, and honor. Within his domain in the realms of chaos, there is only an unending battlefield, pocked with volcanoes, forges, blood rivers, and flows of molten brass. At the center of the madness, Korn sits atop a brass throne within the Brass Citadel. This is known as the Skull Throne, and Korn's most devoted followers and cultists are intent on offering ever greater bounties of skulls to adorn their patron's seat of power. Korn is often depicted as a masculine figure clad in brass and iron armor from head to toe, cloaked only by flames and shadow. Rage is eternally written across his face. Whenever there is a conflict in the universe, Korn is empowered, and it is for these reasons that it is commonly accepted that he is the oldest and most powerful of the Chaos Gods. 
In his service are his demon hordes, including bloodletters and bloodthirsters, monstrous entities of fire and bloodshed who bring great weapons of war and primal ferocity to battle against Korn's foes. Amongst Korn's servants are also the fallen Space Marine Legion of the Primarch Angron, the World Eaters. Korn's sacred number is eight, and often his legions are organized into different divisions of eight. Eight members of Cornate Squadrons, eight ranks of Bloodthirster, eight cohorts in a full-strength Cornate Legion. The followers of the Blood God are not careful in their acts of murder. They are brutal and direct, and if there is to be some ceremony amongst their ranks, it is unlikely to involve much more than carnage and slaughter, for those are some of the few currencies that might draw the Blood God's attention. War cries for those following Korn can be as direct as blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne, or as savage as maim kill burn, maim kill burn. Whilst there are many things that a god of hatred hates, there are few things Korn hates more than sorcery and those who practice it. Korn and his followers see sorcery as a mark of cowardice, that brings dishonor and shows one to be unworthy. This brings him regularly into conflict with one of his rival gods. That god would be the changer of ways, Sinch, the second god of chaos. Sinch is the chaos god of sorcery, magic, change, lies, destiny, ambition, and knowledge. Sinch's domain in the realms of chaos is known as the realm of the sorcerer, and it is a twisted place of madness and illusions. Sinch can be found at the heart of his realm, although perhaps it isn't accurate to say that he can be found at all, seeing as he watches the universe from deep within the heart of his impossible fortress at the end of the ever-changing crystal labyrinth. Sinch's true figure is therefore something of a mystery, but depictions of him often feature some terrible otherworldly thing, with thousands of eyes helping him watch over the worlds. Sinch wears many guises, and perhaps this shouldn't be surprising given that he is also known as the perpetrator of a thousand plots. The sacred number of the Changer of Ways is the number nine, and it can commonly be heard, both whispered and chanted by those who have felt the touch of the Great Conspirator or its agents. Sinch whispers to those that show ambition, and is a patron to those that engage in scheming of any nature, such is the Changer's Way, and such is the way of the demon hordes that bear Tsinch's mark. Amongst their ranks can be found Chaos Horrors, and those who have been mutated by the touch of the warp. But in the elite ranks of Tsinch's forces, one can find the Lords of Change, great towering figures of a distinctly avian appearance, giant carrion birds with staves of magic. They are conduits for some of the most potent sorcery in the universe. Zinch also holds sway over the traitor Chaos Space Marines of the Thousand Suns Legion, whose most powerful members follow in the footsteps of their Primarch, Magnus the Red, and are either bound eternally to their armor or are powerful sorcerers, a story we'll get to in a moment. The followers of the Architect of Fate will preach that all plans and mortal desires are known to Zinch, and that not a single person can escape his many great plans that unfold across many millennia. Zinch's followers will also do as much as they can to interact with things that have psychic influence, given that the ability to use the power and magics of the warp is seen as a great display of one's faith in the Changer of Ways. But even those who lack the skill to use magic can still be influenced by the Architect's power. Mutation is common amongst the rank of those that worship and serve Sinch. Sinch's true goals are ever shifting and incomprehensible to most. Even the greatest Lords of Change cannot comprehend the Architect's visions and schemes in their entirety. The only constant is the lack of a constant, the presence of instability, the aptitude for transformation, the mobility of ascension and dethroning, the presence and essence of change itself. But for every force trying to uproot the universe and alter it, there is another that is trying to let it sit and fester. And as Zinch stands for change, the rival chaos god Nurgle stands for stagnation. 
Nurgle, also known as the Plague Lord, Lord of Decay, or Grandfather Nurgle, is the Chaos God of Disease, Decay, Despair, Death, and Rebirth. Nurgle's domain within the Chaos Realms is known as the Garden of Nurgle, and is as unsightly as the God of Plague is himself. All things that grow in the Garden grow from death, for in Nurgle's domain, the everlasting, intertwined cycle of life and death is paramount to all things. At the center of his garden, Nurgle sits, bloated and festering but also contented. With him, one might find his terrible cauldron, which is reportedly large enough to contain the oceans of every world. Such things are, of course, only possible within the warp itself as is the horror that lies within its great confines. It is said that this great vessel is where the Lord of Decay brews his plagues. With but a single stir of his ladle, Nurgle can create terrible new diseases and spread them far and wide into the galaxy. Nurgle's sacred number is that of seven, and his followers are strange relative to other demons of chaos that one might find within the Chaos Realms, and that's because they are uniquely cheerful. From the great unclean ones that usher in his madness to the tiny Nurglings that surge in and out of their exposed innards, the forces of Nurgle approach battle with a cheer and vigor that would seem surprising. They, like all demons, are a reflection of the passion and enthusiasm with which Nurgle goes about his own work. The traitor legion of the Death Guard and their Primarch Mortarion can also be found in his service having been granted unholy resilience by the Lord of Plague. Nurgle supposedly arose out of the great plagues that haunted humanity in the second millennium, such as the Black Death. Appropriately so, whenever one of Nurgle's virulent plagues takes hold, his power begins to multiply even more greatly than it did before. As death and decay arise, so too does despair, all of which feed the power of the Plague Father. But to those that in this moment of desperation embrace Nurgle, there is a chance of receiving his gifts. Even as your guts spill forth and your open wounds fester and flies pick at the rot, those that embrace Nurgle will be granted an unholy resilience and the even more alluring prize of a reprieve from the pain of his diseases. And when his attendants or their foes do die, Nurgle's glory is born again from the new life that springs forth from their remains. Even the rot feeds the rot father. This is the nature of Nurgle's power, and it is why he is so opposed to Sinch. Where the changer of ways sees mutation as a means to subvert the ways of the universe, Nurgle represents the nature of the universe and the oldest system within it. The cycle of life and death. The way of stagnation. Where one desires change, the other desires a constant in stagnation. In this sense, Nurgle is also a god who embodies nature in all its forms, even those that are unseen, unsightly, and undesired. As much as he represents the life that blooms within the garden, he represents the rot that gnaws at its roots, and the maggots that feast upon the flesh of the dead. One of the strangest notes about Nurgle is that he has taken a companion of sorts, a fellow god, but not of the Chaos Pantheon, of the Eldari Pantheon instead. Her name is Isha, and she is the god of harvest, fertility, nature, life, healing, and growth, and is seen as the divine mother of the Eldari. It is believed that Nurgle feeds all of his poxes to her so that he might test their virulence. Her ability to regrow and regenerate and recover allows her resilience that makes her, unfortunately, suited for this most twisted of roles as a companion. But it is supposedly stated that she then whispers the cures to Nurgle's plague to those that might be inflicted by them. Nurgle's companionship to Isha is only seen as stranger because of the fact that he did not technically just kidnap her. In a strange way, it was also a rescue. And that is because otherwise, she would have been devoured by the fourth god of chaos, Slanesh. The pronunciation of the last god of chaos's name, be it Slanesh or Slanesh, varies, but undoubtedly there is one fact that does not. This is the chaos god that forces fear out of the Eldari in particular. 
They are known as the Dark Prince, the Lord of Excess, she who thirsts, the God of Pain, Pleasure, Excess, Passion, Perfection, and Hedonism. Slanesh is the youngest of the Chaos Gods by our time, and was born in the Great Folly of the Aldari, but as far as the warp is concerned, it morphs and changes time and perception, so perhaps, as far as the warp knows, Slanesh has always been there. But it was still the Aldari who created this monstrosity, though not deliberately. Through their late empire's overwhelming culture of decadence and depravity, Slanesh arose, and their birth brought about the creation of a seething wound in both our reality and the Immaterium. It is known today as the Eye of Terror. Slanesh's domain within the Realms of Chaos, also known as the Realm of the Dark Prince, is strange and is almost as twisting as Sinch's, and yet also is strangely straightforward. For whilst it is a labyrinth, it is not one that forces those who traverse it to get lost within its many corners. Instead, it is one that simply tempts them to walk from the straightforward path as often as they can. And this is purely based on the different circles that one must navigate to enter the Palace of Slanesh at the center of the Dark Prince's realm. To reach it, you must navigate the circles of seduction and stand fast in the face of all possible temptations, from gluttony to lust, from glory to sloth. Should one reach the fabled grounds of the Palace of Pleasure, one might realize that it lies undefended. For when one sees Slanesh and realizes that they stare upon a perfect being, they are invariably lost to the Dark Prince. Slanesh is often depicted with a somewhat androgynous form with both male and female anatomy, but those who gaze upon the Dark Prince know that their true form is whatever the being beholding them might desire in that moment. Slanesh, in this sense, has many forms or no true form, though the common factor amongst all iterations of Slanesh and their demons are a pair of devilish horns atop their head and potentially the addition of claws. The Dark Prince is empowered by excess in all things and in all sensations. Those that unknowingly invoke Slanesh's favor might be rich imperial governors with more wealth than they could spend, or those who have an excessively gluttonous or exotic set of tastes. The excess that Slanesh is most commonly associated with is that of the demonetized kind of excess, which, I mean, yeah, you can look that up on a different kind of website. But the important aspect of these things is not what they are, it's the fact that they are the most excessive versions of that experience. This extends to everything, not just your more adult encounters, but everything from food to glory to poetry to beauty to pain to pleasure. To adequately demonstrate this difference, one needs to understand how you worship Slanesh. If you face a warrior of corn on the battlefield, he might attempt to honor his lord by giving you the kind of blood-filled and quick death that you would expect in martial combat. If anything else, this is part of what separates corn and his worshippers from the worship of Slanesh. Death is sudden. With a sacrifice to the Dark Prince being quick, there is nothing that can truly be gained, but if it is slow, then there are a wealth of experiences to be had. Whilst a quick and bloody certain death awaits those who are sacrificed to corn, there is perhaps a worse fate for those sacrificed to Slanesh, as slow and gruesome, torturous experiences likely await you. This is the basis of their direct opposition to corn, the blood god. For the blood god wishes death to all things, and for excess in nothing but hatred, skulls, and blood. The Dark Prince would instead run a gamut of all existence and entice all those within it to drink to their heart's content and to fulfill their most twisted wishes. Tribute does not flow from a quick and brutal murder like it does from a slow and agonizing torture made up of a thousand different sensations. In service to the Lord of Excess, one will find many demons who will take on the twisted perfection of their prince, such as demonettes and the most exalted of the Dark Prince's servants, the Keepers of Secrets. 
Most of these beings are also androgynous in their appearance, being once again split down the middle between male and female. The traitor legion of the Emperor's children and their Primarch Fulgrim also count themselves amongst the servants of the perfect prince. Slanesh is feared by the Eldari that brought about her creation above all others. Known to them as She That Thirsts, Slanesh hungers for the souls of the beings that created her and will stop at nothing to devour them, unless they are protected by the provisions of a spirit stone, or perhaps with gruesome torture all unto itself, Eldari souls will almost immediately be consumed upon their death. Such is the voracious appetite of the Dark Prince. Avoiding death is therefore something that most Eldari will attempt to do with any circumstance. They realize that there is a far more terrible reality waiting for them should they fall, and not have the proper provisions in place. Normally all four gods of chaos find themselves in opposition to each other, and certainly in this respect they are each other's greatest rivals. Sinch and Nurgle will do battle just as Slanish and Korn will. This constitutes an unending conflict within the realms of chaos and the warp, a conflict that has been known as the Great Game. Within the warp, power is ever shifting, and the four gods of chaos are forever warring amongst themselves. Out in the Immaterium, whole armies of warp entities clash on a regular basis, as do the servants of the dark gods. This great conflict between the four gods has been going on since their inception, and is known as the Great Game. Each of the gods is empowered by the actions of every sentient being in the galaxy, and each of the gods therefore sees their powers wax and wane according to the events of real space. Most of the time, the great game is all that the ruinous powers will concern themselves with. It is rare for anything to become pressing enough to be of a concern to them outside of their own domains, but occasionally there can be such a moment. When there is a threat to the Chaos Gods or the supremacy of Chaos as a whole, the gods can momentarily put aside the great game and intervene. Moments like when the Emperor's Primarch children were scattered in their infancy are attributed to this idea of the Four Gods of Chaos uniting momentarily. Sometimes, even this is not enough, and the Chaos Gods will nominate a single profane champion. The greatest was the Imperium's War Master, Horus Luprakal, Primarch of the Space Marine Legion that were known as the Lunar Wolves, who would one day come to be known as the Black Legion. Such a champion is known as a Lord of Chaos Undivided, and will see forces of all four Chaos Gods join their ranks as they move to accomplish their great objectives. In the more modern times of the 42nd millennium, the ruling champion of Chaos Undivided is one of Horus's direct successors, Abaddon the Despoiler, the inheritor of Horus's legacy, who has embarked on not one but thirteen Black Crusades, the last of which shattered the world of Cadia, the Imperium's greatest fortress world that held Chaos at bay. Such is the power of the Chaos Gods when they provide their power to a single unholy champion. Their will and determination can drive their servants to commit unspeakable acts that defy sanity and the very fabric of the universe itself. And what better place to see such madness on display than in the region of space where one might find that fortress world of Cadia, the region known as the Eye of Terror. Something should be made clear from the very beginning. Do not mistake the Eye of Terror with the Eye of Terror. The Eye of Terror doesn't necessarily exist. The Eye of Terror does, though. The Eye of Terror is a region of space that was once prominently populated by the Eldari before their fall from grace. When their overwhelming culture of decadence and debauchery had begun to boil over, and when the excess was too great they brought about the birth of Slanesh. This cataclysm was so terrible in its scope that it shook both the warp and the materium to their foundations and ripped a tear between the two. The warp began to then bleed out into the material plane around this area, Massive warp storms formed, and the Eye of Terror was born. As such, within the region of space surrounding the Eye of Terror, the forces of Chaos would easily find purchase, 
and those worlds that fell under their sway would be known as Demon Worlds. After the Horus Heresy, and after the defeat of the War Master, the traitor legions fled from terror, and they made their way to the Galactic Northwest, where they would be chased all the way back to the Eye of Terror by the Loyalists. As a result, this part of space contains some of the greatest concentrations of Chaos Space Marine Legions and Traitor Guardsmen in the entire galaxy. There are, however, further inhabitants of this sector of space, though none are as troubled as the Eldari. Despite the world's proximity to the warp and the Eldari's most feared enemy of Slanesh, they need to maintain a presence within the Eye of Terror, as it contains the Crone Worlds, many of which are now Demon Worlds. These are the remnants of their now destroyed empire. New Spirit Stones that are used to guard against the Chaos God of Excess can only be discovered on these old Crone Worlds, alongside countless other valuable technologies from the days of the old Eldari Empire. What's even more unfortunate is that many of these worlds are not merely classified as demon worlds for their proximity to the Eye of Terror. Many of them have been infectiously invaded by Chaos forces of all stripes, and so the Eldari's task here is bitter and difficult. However, there are hints that the Eye of Terror might actually have existed for far longer than many suspect. The Necron's Blackstone Pylon Fields of Cadia and the other worlds in proximity to the Eye of Terror provide us a hint to this possibility, as it appears they were created long ago during the times of the ancient Necrons in order to contain the Eye of Terror. Had Abaddon not chosen to smash a Blackstone Fortress into Cadia, then they may well have done just this. Over the course of the many Black Crusades, though, Abaddon the Despoiler destroyed many of the Pylon Fields on other worlds, and with the destruction of Cadia itself, the Eye of Terror began to grow, implying that the Pylon Fields were indeed part of what was holding back this great storm of the warp. What happened next is not completely understood. Whether it was a result of the Pylon Fields' destruction alone, or the fall of Cadia, or the return of the Primarch Rebuta Gilliman, or a combination of these events, the warp began to expand chaotically outside of the Eye of Terror. From the galactic northwest where one finds the Eye of Terror to the furthest reaches of the eastern fringe, a series of warp storms began to appear and expand. Now, warp storms are known to periodically crop up from the Immaterium, but these storms rose with unusual speed, and their combined effect was unlike anything that had been seen before in all of galactic history. The warp storms began to overlap, and eventually, a line was formed, bisecting the whole of the galaxy, warp storms separating one side of it from the other. Thus, at the dawn of the 42nd millennium, the Cicatrix Maledictum appeared, the Great Rift was born, and cut the galaxy in two. The Imperium of Man, which spanned all of the galaxy, was thrown into utter turmoil when this occurred. On the side of the Great Rift where Terra was located, the Astronomicon's light still shone, but in the night sky, the Great Rift could be seen, like a scar across all of space. For the worlds on the other side, though, the reality of the situation was far, far more dire. Without the light of the Astronomicon, the great lighthouse of terror, there was no way of safely navigating the warp, and thus the worlds on the other side of the Great Rift were cut off from all their supplies and communications with the wider Imperium. Worlds in this part of the galaxy are part of what is referred to as the Dark Imperium or Imperium Nihilus. Many worlds near the Great Rift have disappeared or been consumed in madness, as time and the laws of reality are bent by the powers of the warp. These worlds now find themselves in a desperate battle for survival, as demons and legions of traitors are mobilized to conquer in the name of the ruinous powers. At this time in the 42nd millennium, where 40k finds itself now, the forces of chaos have never been more powerful. But astoundingly enough, all of these events would arguably never have happened if it wasn't for the actions of the Emperor himself and what he did to his Space Marine legions. To understand why mankind's greatest savior also created the conditions for its most terrible downfall, you need to understand the nature of the Emperor's Imperial Truth. 
the lie contained within it, and how it led to the Horus heresy. So, we should begin with the Imperial Truth then. And it's at this point that you need to understand a little bit about the Emperor. What it's like in the Imperium now, and what it used to be like before the days of the Horus heresy. I think the best example of this can be found simply by referencing a simple phrase that's banded about all over the Imperium, and that's the God Emperor of Mankind. You see, back in the days before the heresy and the rise of the Ecclesiarchy, even saying such a thing would have been seen as an affront to the Emperor's vision and would have led to serious consequences. But in the years after the heresy, as the idea of the Emperor's divinity was accepted and blossomed, it would be seen as a grand heresy to not call the Emperor a god, something that would mean you would be burned at the stake. So what exactly happened? Well, after the Horus heresy, the Emperor began getting worshipped as a god, and there was the rise of the Ecclesiarchy, and eventually it became something expected of Imperial citizens to refer to the Emperor as the God Emperor of Mankind, because faith in the Emperor was beginning to manifest in the truest of forms. But what about everything before? Why was it previously a taboo for people to call the Emperor a God? Well, I'm not going to explain the former, but I am going to explain that. It all starts with the beliefs that the Emperor propagated as he took over Terra at the end of the Age of Strife, where humanity nearly destroyed itself. This is the so-called Imperial Truth. It's the ideology that the Emperor championed for all of mankind, which proclaimed that there were no gods, that nothing was supernatural, and that mankind would advance to glory and rightfully rule the galaxy through a true understanding of the sciences and through rationality. This belief was materialist, secular, scientific, logical. The Emperor also banned the use of artificial intelligence within the Imperium, as he had seen the devastation that had been wrought upon mankind in the Dark Age of Technology, thanks to the Men of Iron and the Men of Gold, but that's beside the point. For the Emperor, this was a means of helping humanity to escape the previous pitfalls that it endured thanks to religious superstition in its past. The Imperial Truth held that yes, there were other dimensions, and there were certainly other alien races that held powers that could be seen as magic, but the core of the Imperial Truth also stated that these powers were simply poorly understood, and that, supernatural as they might seem to us now, with a proper understanding of the nature of reality, they too could be explained. It was upon this Imperial Truth that the Emperor of Mankind built his entire dominion, and regardless of his intent with these beliefs, they would unfortunately plant the seeds of his downfall. The idea that there was no supernatural element to the world was, of course, the lie at the heart of the Imperial Truth. The warp was not only supernatural, but more importantly, it was malicious and hungry for the blood of mankind. At first, one might be puzzled, because you can sit there and wonder how the Imperial Truth being enforced led to the rise of chaos within the Imperium. After all, an ignorance of the warp's true nature is sort of a shield against it, right? You can empower the gods of chaos by worshipping them, so establishing an empire without gods is an empire that supposedly doesn't have supplicants feeding chaos. And that's true, but the problem of course is that you don't just feed the gods of chaos by worshipping them, and worshipping the gods of chaos does not merely happen by opening a prayer book and chanting blood for the blood god skulls for the skull throne, it happens through actions and deeds. You see, the gods of chaos are not just empowered by direct worship in that sense. Whenever someone commits an act that venerates them, they draw power from it. Whenever someone commits murder, they don't have to draw the mark of corn in blood for the act itself to have empowered corn. The gods of chaos arose without direct worshippers, and they might be empowered by cults who worship them, but they don't exactly need them explicitly to survive or even thrive. Imperial truth or not, the gods of chaos were still going to be around no matter what happened. And that's also not considering that the gods of chaos were also trying to actively influence people within the Imperium. And in this endeavor, they would end up being wildly successful. Such was the case with the word bearers. It sometimes takes only a single spark to light a fire. If the Horus Heresy was the fire that would engulf the Imperium and leave it in smouldering ruin, then the pyre upon which that fire began was not the wounding of the Emperor, or the dropside massacre of the Istvan system, or even the initial corruption of Horus Luprakal. 
It would instead be the faith of Lorgar Aurelian, the Emperor's reaction to it, the fate of the so-called perfect city, Monarchia, and the actions of the ruinous power's most useful mortal instrument, Erebus. For his part, Lorgar Aurelian, Primarch of the 17th Legion, was a man of great charisma. His ability as a great orator and his upbringing in the service of an exiled priest would make him the archetypal preacher or prophet. This was also accompanied by visions in his dreams of a man clad in bronze armor with a sword of fire and a towering one-eyed figure at his side. Lorgar believed that these visions portrayed the essence of a god and another of his disciples. Preaching about these figures and how they might soon arrive was enough to start a holy war upon the world of Colchis, which Lorgar won with his superior abilities as a Primarch. Then, as if validating his dreams as faithful prophecy, one year later the figures from his visions arrived. The people that disembarked from space were immediately known to Lorgar. The man clad in bronze was the Emperor, his father. The man in the blue robe was his brother and fellow Primarch, Magnus the Red, who had arrived with his legion, the Thousand Sons. All of Colchis celebrated their reunification, but the Emperor was greatly displeased by the manner of these celebrations. Lorgar had known a life of faith, and was wholly incompatible with the secular nature of the Imperial truth. Lorgar was united with his Space Marine Legion, which he renamed to the Word Bearers. He was expected to command them to immediately join the Crusade in its quest to reunite the Imperium. As Lorgar did join the Crusade, he elevated those within the priesthood of Colchis to relevant roles within the Word Bearers Legion. This included one Erebus, who would eventually be elevated to the position of First Chaplain. The secret of Erebus was that from his birth and before he took on the name of Erebus, he was being whispered to by the ruinous powers. In fact, the entire religious system of Colchis was an aspect of chaos worship. With a modicum of maneuvering and scheming, Erebus positioned himself to become one of the most loyal acolytes in Lorgar's service, long before he was picked up by the Imperium. Eventually, this led to his ascension into a space marine, Whilst he would need to bite his time, he would be the spark for this kindling. But first, there needed to be a pyre. This is where Lorgar would play his part, because he really did not understand the nature of the Great Crusade and the empire that he had joined. This empire of secularism just didn't make sense to Lorgar, and regardless of what Lorgar felt, the Emperor desired secularism even towards himself at all times. Tragically, any warnings that Lorgar might have received fell on deaf ears. His word bearers would go on to conquer many worlds, but they would then convert them and rebuild them into great religious worlds of pristine spires and grand monuments instead of moving on to reunite more of humanity. Their chaplains would espouse the faith of the Emperor of Mankind, claiming that he was a god, and Lorgar Aurelian himself penned a great work called the Lectitio Divinitatis, and promoted the tenets of this faith. But this made the word-bearers slow, and their lack of progress would be noted by the Emperor. When the Emperor discovered the reason for this slow progress, he was utterly incensed. His son had not only disobeyed his orders, but had seemingly flaunted them before his very eyes, and had brought the one thing he had not desired into the Imperium. To the religious, this would be called apostasy. To the Emperor, it was simply betrayal. It was the Emperor's decision that Lorgar and his legion had to be punished, and that punishment would go beyond brutality. Lorgar received commands for his legion to return to the planet of Kur. This world held a special place within the heart of the Wordbearers and their Primarch. It was where the Wordbearers had raised the marvel that was Monarchia the so-called perfect city. Every facet of its construction, its people, its culture, all of it venerated the Emperor's divinity, even down to the smallest specks upon the greatest of statues. When the word bearers arrived, along with their Primarch, they were forced to kneel before the Emperor. 
Lorgar was not greeted by his father as he might have hoped. Instead, he was reprimanded and reminded of the purpose of the Imperium and its legions. They were bred for the purpose of battle, not to spread faith. The Emperor, who was flanked by Gilliman and the Ultramarines, then commanded the word bearers and Lorgar to stop and watch. They were not permitted to move. The Ultramarines and Robuta Gilman then turned to the perfect city of Monarchia and raised it to the ground, all as Lorgar and his legions looked on. And so it was that from the fires of Monarchia, the Emperor of Mankind would again decree that his empire was not one of faith, it would be one instead of rationality and reason. Lorgar and his legion were utterly broken both in purpose and spirit. For weeks, Lorgar mourned the loss of his people, and in this time, there were few who could speak to him. But one such figure was Erebus. Lorgar would listen to the words of his first chaplain. Erebus spoke of the forces within the universe that would verify his faith, even in the face of what the Emperor had told him. Erebus informed Lorgar that there was indeed a force of divinity in the universe, and that he could serve it. Lorgar would set out on a pilgrimage to discover the truth for himself. This led him to Cadia, and into the Eye of Terror. He encountered many terrible forces on his journey, but in the end, thanks to the intervention of the demon prince Ingafel the Ascended, and the two-headed Lord of Change known as Kairos Fateweaver, Lorgar was convinced to turn to chaos. Thus the corruptions of the legions truly began with its first fallen Primarch, Lorgar Aurelian. More importantly, Lorgar realized the ultimate notion that would undo the Emperor's work. The Imperial Truth was a lie. The basis of the Emperor's entire dominion was false. Lorgar might have been the first to be corrupted amongst the Primarchs, but it would take over a century for the corruption of others to take hold. Erebus' work with Lorgar was mostly complete, but he would subsequently be dispatched by the Primarch to ensure that others would see this primordial truth. And Erebus chose his next target well. He chose the greatest of the Emperor's servants, the first son the Emperor ever recovered, the War Master of the Great Crusade. He chose Horus. As the Emperor's first recovered son from the Great Crusade, Horus was a giant amongst the Primarchs. His lunar wolves were always on the forefront of the Crusade, his sword was one that delivered the Emperor's wrath the most often, and his command of the Great Crusade was made complete after the Emperor named him as War Master officially. He was the Emperor's greatest weapon, and he would also become Erebus' greatest prize. His plan began with a strengthening of ties. He placed himself amongst Horus's lunar wolves, and made sure that he infiltrated the trusted company of the Primarch's inner circle. And from here, as he had done before, Erebus would bide his time, until an opportunity for corruption amongst the numbers of the lunar wolves began to show itself. It showed itself when an offshoot of humanity known as the Interrex was discovered. Initial contact with the Interrex was peaceful, as was sometimes the case in the time of the Great Crusade. Whilst some worlds were possessed of the foolhardy notion that they might resist the legions of the Imperium, most would see the expansive nature of the great fleets above their planets and the might of the Astartes, and would think twice about refusing the offer of vassalization. The negotiations were going well with the Interrex as a result, but Erebus had other plans, not just to drive the Interrex into war, but also for something that they held. He breached the great Interrex Hall of Devices. From here, he stole an ancient weapon, a blade known as the Anathema. When this blade was reported stolen, it quickly led to the breakdown in relations between the Interrex and Horus's Crusaders. An entirely avoidable conflict broke out, and Horus was forced to crush the Interrex into submission. For the time being, he greatly regretted it, but ultimately, none of this mattered to Erebus. The goal of destroying the Interrex was never one he held. 
His goal was simply to weaken the War Master and make him more pliable, and he had a tool with which he could accomplish this. Taking the anathema, he would find one of Horus' oldest and most trusted human friends, Yugen Temba. Yugen and his crew would fall to chaos and were gifted with horrific powers and resilience by the chaos god Nurgle. Erebus would then ensure that Temba was armed with the anathema blade. When Horus returned to find his old friend Temba, he instead had to face his corrupted and twisted form in battle. Empowered by the anathema, Temba struck Horus with a mortal wound. The four captains of the Mournival, the closest confidants and advisors of Horus within his own legion, realized that the wound was beyond their ability to heal. It was here that Erebus stepped in and offered assistance, stating that he could find a new way to heal the War Master, but only if he was entrusted to Erebus's care. And so it was that Erebus was able to commune with Horus's unconscious mind. Within Horus's mind, Erebus set about corrupting the War Master to the powers of chaos. Magnus would attempt to intervene and save his brother, but it was far too late. After the War Master awoke and recovered from the wound of the Anathema Blade, the path of history had been set. Horus would turn on his father and the Imperium of Man. He would become the champion of the ruinous powers and would take the first steps on the path to the Horus Heresy. When Horus was ready to start his Great Rebellion, he had made a crucial assessment of the legions under his command and where their loyalties would lie. If he was going to overthrow the Emperor of Mankind, his first strike would need to be a decisive one. From there he would need to push his advantages all the way to the Golden Throne of Terra itself. He would not only need to purge the Loyalists of the Emperor within the ranks of the legions at his command, but he would also need to deal a crippling blow to those legions that would be unswervingly loyal to the Emperor, even to their dying breath. This would all be accomplished within a single system under false pretenses, and that system would be Istvan. This solar system was home to the rebelling forces of the Istvanians, and it was on Istvan III that the legions of the Death Guard, World Eaters, Sons of Horus, and at least a few of the Emperor's children would be initially purged of loyalists. If Horus declared war against the Emperor immediately, his legions would be split down the middle, and infighting would prevent any meaningful unified resistance from taking place. This was why Horus' assessments of his legion were so crucial. The majority of those Astartes that were loyal to the Emperor were deployed planetside on Istvan III. When the loyalist forces of those legions were all planetside, Horus made his move and released the so-called Life Eater Virus, a weapon with the power to kill the Astartes and the Istvanian forces en masse. Those forces on the surface that were loyal to Horus were ordered to seal themselves in bunkers or within the sheltered hulls of Titans so that they might escape this blight. But the Loyalists were left exposed and withered away into nothingness. Only a few fortunate souls were able to escape this reign of terrible death. In the following engagements, on the planet's surface, Horus would proceed to order his traitors to wipe out the remaining loyalists that had seen the War Master's treachery. After this goal had been achieved, it was time for Horus to go after the legions of his brothers. And though it was on Istvan III that the first blow was struck, it was on Istvan V that the Horus heresy would truly begin. The battle would take place and would be known as the Dropsite Massacre and would see the loyalist Ravenguard, Salamanders, and Iron Hand legions ambushed by the traitor legions in great numbers. True to its name, the massacre rendered the forces of the Iron Hands almost completely eliminated. Only 3,000 Ravenguard Astartes escaped. The Salamanders also suffered heavy casualties. Most importantly of all, both the Primarchs of the Iron Hands and the Salamanders were killed in this defining opening engagement of the Horus Heresy. The death of Vulcan of the Salamanders was not completely consequential, given that he was a perpetual, a being with a spark of immortality, who would even return during the days of the Heresy to face down other traitors within the legions of the Astartes. But the Iron Hand's Primarch Ferus Manus was not so lucky. 
his death would be final. But the Horus Heresy is a massive sequence of events. It is a time when at the height of its power the Imperium of Man absolutely tore itself asunder. But the defining battle of the Horus Heresy was always one that would be fought for the true seat of humanity's power in Sol. It would be decided in Terra, and the Siege of Terra would be the cataclysmic battle that everyone expected it to be. But there is one event that I'm going to touch on before we talk about that, one that made the Siege of Terra all the more difficult for the Emperor, an event that was set in motion with the best of intentions, as are all things that pave the road to hell. It's here that we need to pivot to talk about the plot that more closely relates to Chaos in Space Marine 2, one that leads to part of why we fight the Thousand Suns Legion. Much as there are many, many important events in the Horus Heresy, there is one that directly impacted the faction of Chaos that we will fight against, and it would happen thanks to their Primarch, Magnus the Red. There are some who will argue persistently that Magnus did nothing wrong. I'm not here to get into the specifics of whether that's a valid opinion or not. What I will say is that I think it's fair to interpret Magnus's folly as a tragedy from any perspective. I will also say that without his actions in this time period of the Horus Heresy, it most certainly would have been much simpler for the Emperor to defend Holy Terror. To understand Magnus, you need to understand that despite his appearance, as an entirely red-skinned giant individual missing one eye, he was not some great brute. He was instead the most powerful psyker amongst all the Primarchs and one of the most intelligent within their ranks. However, there was a point in the Great Crusades where various situations were causing psychic powers to become a point of contention, not least of which was the tension between Magnus and his more martially-minded brothers. After the Emperor held a great debate on the matter of psychic powers on the planet of Nikea at a council, he decreed that there would be restrictions on those who could use psychic powers within the Imperium. Only the navigators, who were responsible for warp travel on Imperial vessels, and astropaths, who were responsible for long-range warp communication, were allowed to use their powers. Needless to say, Magnus was less than pleased with that ruling. But he was a loyal son at the time, and maybe he didn't respect the Emperor's wishes, but he would continue to carry them out, disbanding the psychers within his legion like every other Primarch would. However, for Magnus and the Thousand Sons in particular, this was truly painful, as his legion were highly attuned to the energies of the warp, and this left them with many more psychers in their ranks. This weakened Magnus's legion, of course, and weakened Magnus. He couldn't use his great psychic might. But then came the heresy, and the most dire of moments. As I said before, Magnus would attempt to stop Horus from falling to chaos when Erebus entered his mind. Magnus appeared as a vision within Horus's mind alongside Erebus, arguing as the better angel, trying to prevent him from falling to corruption. Alas, it was all in vain. Having realized before anyone else that there was a terrible betrayal about to befall the Imperium, Magnus knew that he had to warn the Emperor. But unfortunately for Magnus, the machinations of the Chaos Gods were already starting to take hold. From his location at the time on the planet of Prospero, the recruiting world and home of the Thousand Suns Legion, there were a massive series of warp storms. This prevented Magnus from either traveling to Terra or making an astropathic communication to the Emperor. Magnus at this point made a desperate decision. He used an astral projection spell to reach the Emperor in rebellion against all the accords that he had attempted to put forth and the banning of psychic power. As his astral projection form was set alight, he found himself navigating the warp and trying to find his father, trying to find Terra. It was at this moment that he found a part of what looked like the Eldari webway. Magnus knew that the webway of the Eldari was a faster and safer and more reliable means of travel than the warp, and so he rushed towards it. Little did he know that this was not a section of the Eldari webway. Instead, it had been constructed by human hands. 
This was a part of the Emperor's attempt to imitate the great technology of the Eldari and gift it to mankind. It was part of the Emperor's own Webway project. Despite all his best efforts, Magnus could not push through the outer walls of the Imperial Webway to gain access. His power wasn't enough to breach into the corridor. But then, a strange voice began to emanate from within Magnus's psyche. It promised him that his purpose was not in vain, and it promised him the power necessary to break through and reach his father. Magnus would accept this without question, and in doing so enacted the plans of the architect of fate, the Chaos God, Sinch. As Magnus burst through into the webway, the breach was opened, and demons poured through into the Imperial webway. Following the webway branch to its conclusion, Magnus found his astral projection emerging at the Golden Throne of Terror, before the Emperor. But the Emperor was not pleased to see him and did not listen to him. Instead, he was enraged. Magnus had destroyed part of his webway project and had allowed the forces of chaos within. To him, he was a traitor. Magnus's warnings of Horus and his betrayal fell on deaf ears. The breach was then onwards known as Magnus's Folly, and the Adeptus Custodes and Sisters of Silence would fight the demons that poured forth from it for the remainder of the heresy, thus weakening one of the Emperor's greatest forces that he could have used to stave off the enemy, and making Terra far more vulnerable in the event of its inevitable siege. For his betrayal, Magnus was branded a traitor, and the Emperor sent his executioner Primarch, Lehman Russ, to bring Magnus to justice. Lehman Russ gathered his Space Marine Legion, the Space Wolves, and prepared to march upon Prospero. In this moment, realizing the division of the Loyalists, Horus contacted Russ. He lied, informing his brother that the orders from the Emperor had changed, and that instead of bringing Magnus to justice, he was simply to kill him. Lehman Russ gladly obliged. And so the Space Wolves and Lehman Russ made their way to Prospero, and set it aflame. Outraged at the destruction of the knowledge that he had gathered over the many years, Magnus engaged Lehman Russ in single combat. Even with his psychic powers, Magnus was no match for the Primarch of the Wolves. As Lehman Russ raised his weapon to strike a mortal blow, Magnus and the entire Legion of the Thousand Suns were teleported into the warp thanks to a ritual that he had planned out with one of the greater psychers of the Thousand Suns, Azek Ahriman. Magnus's mortal form was slain on Prospero and shattered into shards. They would reform in time, save for one that represented his good nature and humanity. But for now, Magnus had pulled all his forces into the warp and everything of value from Prospero was gone. Magnus would pledge himself to Chaos and to the Chaos God Sinch, and all his forces would join the traitor legions in turn. As I've said, there are a lot of really defining moments in the Horus Heresy, but after the burning of Prospero, there is only one other that we should concern ourselves with, and that is the greatest moment of it all, the Siege of Terror itself. But even with this most defining event, we can't cover every aspect of it. So, we're gonna try and cover the most important parts that pertain to the final confrontation between the Emperor of Mankind and Horus Luprakal. I went into some details in my last video, but the reality is that the entire confrontation goes a whole lot deeper than I previously stated. If you missed that video and like this one, you might want to check that one out, especially if you're new to the setting. The broad picture at the end of the Siege of Terror looked pretty grim for the Loyalists. The Dark Angels, Space Wolves, and Ultramarines were trying to return to Terror as fast as they could, but the Traitor Legions had been grinding the fortifications built by Rogal Dawn to dust with a slow and steady determination. Despite various successful skirmishing actions by the White Scars of Jagatai Khan and the valiant defense of the Blood Angels, it was clear that things were not going well. But Horus knew that time was also a critical factor, so he enacted a rather desperate gambit. He wished to face the Emperor alone in single combat, 
and he knew that the Emperor's death would crush the Loyalist forces. So, he lowered the defenses on his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit. This way he hoped to lure the Emperor into a trap, and into a final confrontation so he could kill him outright once and for all, empowered by all four gods of chaos. For his part, the Emperor had been at the Golden Throne, trying to keep it operational as the hordes of demons assaulted it from the webway entrance below. One of his closest advisors, and one of the most powerful psychers in existence at the time, Malkador the Sigilite, informed the Emperor of what had happened, and that Horus's vessel was weak enough to strike. Gathering his sons and advisors, the Emperor informed those in attendance that he was going to assault the Vengeful Spirit personally. Initially, the Primarch Sanguinius of the Blood Angels was to man the forces of terror in the Emperor's stead, but when Sanguinius eloquently protested, the Emperor changed his mind. And so it was that the Emperor of Mankind, along with the Primarchs Sanguinius and Rogaldorn, and an assortment of other heroes of humanity, would teleport aboard the Vengeful Spirit. Aided by the forces of Valdor and the Emperor's companions, the elite amongst the forces of the Imperial Adeptus Custodes, as well as the remaining forces of the Adeptus Custodes en masse, the Sanguinary Guard and the Blood Angels First Company, and the Imperial Fist's elite legions of Terminator Herskals. The military action would be known as Operation Anabasis, and would change the Imperium forever. But for the Emperor to leave, someone would need to take his place on the Golden Throne, and in this endeavor, Malkador the Sigilite would take up the Emperor's mantle, and keep the webway under control in the Emperor's stead. It was a sacrifice that would cost him his life. As one of the few who had been with the Emperor since near the beginning of the Imperium, and one of his truly most faithful servants, the Emperor elected to declare that this man would no longer be known as Malkador the Sigilite, but would instead be known forevermore as Malkador the Hero. No member of the Imperium has ever been honored in such a way since, for even though he was wise beyond his years and held remarkable psychic power, Malkador was, by many other measures, just another normal human. In the presence of the inhuman and some might even say godlike Astartes, Custodes, and Primarchs. But with his sacrifice, he had gifted the Emperor and the Loyalists a chance at victory. And so they seized it. Teleporting aboard the Vengeful Spirit left everyone in a state of disarray. Many were separated from their initial boarding groups, and Horus was able to spring his trap at last. Many that made their way to the Vengeful Spirit were waylaid by some obstacle, or pinned down by ambushing forces, or captured in illusions. Horus's corruption was so strong that he even managed to temporarily corrupt the Emperor's own custodian guard when they arrived. Several of them had to be killed by the Emperor himself before he could cleanse the taint of chaos from the remainder of them. Whilst the Borders would eventually regain control of the situation, they were left weakened by the opening assault, and they were heading to face Horus in a piecemeal fashion, as opposed to a single united front. The first to reach him was Sanguinius. He had seen the visions of his own death, and wished to defy fate even as he met it head on. During their conflict, Horus attempted to convince Sanguinius to join him many a time. Sanguinius refused Horus's offer at every turn, even in the midst of brutal combat, even as he was losing. As Horus sensed the Emperor approaching, he finally ended the duel, shattering Sanguinius's angelic form and breaking perhaps the most beloved of the Primarchs across the entirety of the Imperium. The death of Sanguinius would be felt by his entire legion, sending them into a frenzy of carnage and bloodshed that was insatiable. The Legion had felt such bloodlust before. It had been called the Red Thirst, but Sanguinius had taught his Legion to take control of their emotions and to channel the energy of this Red Thirst into their passions. But with the death of their Primarch, all the Blood Angels experienced the moment of his passing and saw Horus's vision on the face of every friend and foe. The Legion was overtaken by madness, the Black Rage an even greater hatred that rendered them completely insane. They drove back the forces of chaos, 
The Loyalist forces were likewise ravaged by the Legion of the Blood Angels and their sudden onset of blood-spurred insanity. The Emperor arrived to face Horus Lupracal, but he was too late to save his son Sanguinius. He ordered those at his side to take down Sanguinius's body which had been strung up by demons, even as Horus brushed aside the Astartes and made mad proclamations at the Emperor of Man, his father did not address him. He instead addressed the Gods of Chaos directly, declaring that they had killed his son, referencing not just Sanguinius, but also Horus himself. The War Master did not take kindly to being ignored, and launched into direct combat with the Master of Mankind. The battle was one fought on the material and immaterial planes, and saw Horus and the Emperor battling each other on not just the vengeful spirit, but across many different dimensions and locations in the past and future. Many details of the Emperor's battle with Horus seem strange and are the subject of legend. Some say that it was a member of the Custodes that attacked Horus and gave the Emperor a key moment to escape. Others say that the Emperor was gifted time by the actions of a lone guardsman, armed with only a Laz rifle. Others say that in his hubris, Horus temporarily gave up his powers of chaos to destroy the Emperor with his power alone. Regardless of the truth, even though he had been utterly shattered by Horus's unending assault, the Emperor was able to strike and deliver a mortal wound to Horus channeling all his psychic might into Horus' body, even as the Chaos Gods reasserted their control. The Emperor was able to sunder Horus' soul utterly. When the deed was done, all that remained of the War Master was a charred skeleton and a set of steaming power armor. The Gods of Chaos had lost their pawn and divested their presence and power from the ensuing battles of Holy Terror. The traitor legions were defeated. But the cost was utterly staggering. As Rogel Dorn finally made his way to the bridge, he saw what remained of his father. His long black hair had been burned away, and Horus had gouged out one of his eyes. The Emperor's spine had been shattered, and one of his arms had been mutilated to the point of near separation. Dorn hurriedly brought the bodies of the fallen back to Terra, and the Emperor was rushed to the Golden Throne. It was there that he saw the last moments of Malkador, who had held on for as long as he could. By the time the group had returned, he had all but turned to dust. The Emperor was sat back and installed into the Golden Throne once more, and at long last, Robuta Gilman's Ultramarines and their reinforcing fleet returned to Terra and drove out the remaining traitors, and with this, the Imperium declared what could only be described as a Pyrrhic victory. What followed would be known as the Great Scouring. For a full seven years, the traitor legions were driven back by loyalist forces and contained within the Eye of Terror. In this time, the forces of Chaos suffered many defeats, but they would also regroup into the structures and organization that we know them better by today. The Siege of Terror was over, but the battle for the soul of mankind had only just begun. And for those who inherited Horus's mantle, those such as Abaddon the Despoiler, it was merely the first battle in a long, long war. And it's here that we can finally pivot to explaining the place of Chaos in Space Marine 2. The background of what happened in the Horus Heresy is such that without it, a lot of what's being talked about in Space Marine 2 won't make sense. Space Marine 2 is set 11,000 years after the Horus Heresy, and so many things about both the Imperium and its relationship with the traitor Astartes has changed. The Emperor is now worshipped as the God Emperor of Mankind, for starters, and the strict religious doctrine of the Imperium has been cemented and the Imperial Truth has been rewritten and forgotten from what it used to be. Commentary on this fact is made by everyone, including the Chaos Marines and Chaos Sorcerers that you face. They commonly refer to the Emperor as a Carrion or Corpse God, reflecting upon his state of being 11,000 years after he was brutalized by Horus. But to understand the specific enemy you face in Space Marine 2, we're going to need to talk about Magnus the Red again, because it's his traitor legion that we face off against, the Thousand Sons. 
This traitor legion was of course led by Magnus the Red, who hailed from the planet of Prospero after being banished in his infancy like all the other Primarchs by the gods of Chaos. However, Magnus's legion would take on his most important strength, which was that their gene seed left them with a predisposition for incredible psychic powers. The librarians of Magnus's legion would have been some of the strongest in the Imperium. Unfortunately, all of this power didn't come without side effects. Magnus's gene seed also left the Thousand Sons vulnerable to the other influences of the warp, including the possibility of mutation. To be honest, to call this simply a mutation does somewhat undersell the extent of these changes, as these mutations were referred to by the Thousand Sons Legion as the Flesh Change, and would result in Astartes of the Thousand Sons being mutated irrevocably into terrible monsters known as Chaos Spawn. The numbers of the 15th Legion were starting to dwindle thanks to the Flesh Change even before they were reunited with their Primarch on Prospero for the first time. Magnus would reunite with his Legion and would immediately seek out a cure to the Flesh Change, and would find one, supposedly, when he bargained with a voice in the warp to stop the Flesh Change. Of course, this voice with a bargain to offer was the Chaos God of Change, Tsinch, and Magnus would enact a procedure that would cost most of his legion their lives, as well as one of his own eyes. But it seemingly would work, and the flesh change would go into remission for a short time, even though only about a thousand of the Thousand Sons would remain. It was also at this time that Magnus would begin to assemble arcane lore and forbidden knowledge to him. He would collect all of these findings in the so-called Book of Magnus, all this went on despite the Emperor's warnings that he should not pursue such dark knowledge. After Magnus had been defeated by Lehman Russ back at the burning of Prospero, his form was broken into five shards, which needed to be reunited to allow the Primarch to persist. Four of these five shards were collected by the various forces of the Thousand Sons, who eventually brought them to Magnus's main shard, which had manifested on the planet of Sortiarius, the planet of sorcerers. Eventually, it was discovered that the final shard of Magnus was located on Terra itself, so Magnus finally accepted that he should join the traitor legions and march upon the Imperial Palace. By using psychic masking, Magnus and several of his most trusted sorcerers entered the Imperial Palace. After being informed by Malkador the Sigilite, that it would no longer be possible for him to reclaim the fifth shard of himself, which had been placed in one of the early predecessors of the Grey Knights, Magnus was enraged and would endeavor to head to the Golden Throne to confront the Emperor personally. When he reached the Golden Throne, Magnus was held in a vision by the Emperor, who showed him what awaited him had the legions not turned traitor. Magnus saw a vision of the Imperium reunited down to the last planet, connected by the webway of the Imperium, the Emperor's great gift to humanity, and Magnus himself sat atop the Golden Throne with the ability to peer into all the knowledge of the multiverse. The Emperor offered him this future and claimed that it was still possible, but part of the price of such a change of fates was that the whole of the 15th Legion, every last one of the Thousand Sons, had to be killed as their mutations made them too dangerous to exist within the future of the Imperium. As it turned out, Magnus's deal with Sinch had not cured the flesh change, it had only temporarily halted its spread. Magnus contemplated the decision but could not bear to lose his sons, even to satiate his desire for knowledge. In this moment, as Magnus rejected his cause, the Primarch of the Thousand Sons awoke to find himself doing battle with one who had been guarding the Emperor the whole time, the reconstituted Primarch Vulcan of the Salamanders. He had been reformed and returned to defend his father in his darkest hour. Before Vulcan could land a mortal strike on Magnus, the Primarch gave himself fully to the powers of Chaos and turned traitor entirely. Magnus the Red was ejected from the Imperial Palace by the anti-demonic wards and defenses that had been erected within the facility. 
but from here onward, his path and the path of his legion was set. They would be traitors, and would ally themselves to the architect of fate, the Lord of Change, Sinch. Later in the Siege of Terror, the two Primarchs, Magnus and Vulcan, would do battle once again, and would meet their ends for the sake of the heresy at each other's hands. Vulcan was reduced to atoms by Magnus's spellcraft, and Magnus was banished into the warp with a final strike from Vulcan's hammer. Magnus was not dead, and would still retain control of his legion, but having been banished into the warp he would no longer be able to take part in the conflict on Terra. When the Thousand Sons and other traitors did retreat in the Great Scouring, the Thousand Sons would reassemble on the planet of Sorcerers. The Legion had survived, but the Emperor's words had turned out to be true. The Flesh Change had returned. Magnus had not truly stopped it after all, even after spending the lives of thousands of his sons and even one of his own eyes. In an attempt to stop the Flesh Change permanently, the Thousand Sons Sorcerer, known as Azek Araman, would gather a council of sorcerers within the Legion to his side, and would consult the Book of Magnus. Within, Araman discovered the instructions for a great ritual that he might be able to conduct. With his power and the power of the assembled sorcerers, the entire Legion was gathered to the planet of sorcerers, and a great change fell upon them, just as the Architect of Fate had planned. The ritual, which would be known as the Rubric of Araman, was flawed, but was successful by some estimations. The Thousand Sons were caught amidst the ritual, which manifested as a massive storm of sorcerous energies from the warp that threatened to overwhelm and envelop them. Those members of the Thousand Sons who had sorcerous powers at their disposal became even mightier. The power of their spells started to become almost unrivaled, but those members of the Thousand Sons who had no psychic ability were not so lucky. They would be transformed by the energies of the storm and the magic around them. As the energy coursed through their veins, it turned them to ash with its overwhelming power. Their bodies were destroyed, but their souls still clung to their armor. The armor itself was violently sealed shut, burned into place by the violent magics of the spell. And thus, the Thousand Sons were irrevocably changed. They became a legion of sorcerers and spectres. The flesh change would be stopped, but only on account of most of the legion no longer having flesh to corrupt, for most of them had been saved by being turned into mindless, ghostly things that inhabited their old armor, making most of the legion silent, automaton-like. Legionaries of spirit entombed forever in the gear in which they fought. When Magnus discovered all of this, and also discovered that it had been part of Zinch's plan, he was enraged. He could not kill Araman or his council. As tools of Zinch, they had other uses and the changer of ways would not allow them to be wasted. Not yet. So instead, Magnus commanded Araman and his sorcerers on a Sisyphean quest a quest to discover all there was to learn about Zinch himself. Magnus might have hated Zinch, but for his part he had accepted the power of the Changer of Ways, becoming a powerful demon Primarch of Zinch, and he would then use this power to plot his revenge against the Imperium of Man. He too would utter the same fateful words as Horus, let the galaxy burn, and he too would become one of mankind's greatest enemies, if ever there was a chance for redemption, it was long gone now. Since that day, there have been many wars involving the Thousand Sons, from the offensive action taken against the Space Wolves in the Battle of the Fang, to Magnus's more direct efforts to grant Zeech a stronghold in reality through the remains of Prospero and the Planet of Sorcerers. The most consequential fight for our story, though, is a battle between the forces of Magnus the Red and the newly reborn Ultramarine's Primarch, Robuta Gilliman. Magnus had attempted to lay a series of traps for his newly resurrected Loyalist brother through the Maelstrom and the Webway of the Eldari. Eventually, their battle would spill out into real space, 
and whilst Magnus had hoped to bait the Primarch and his newly acquired Eldari allies into opening the webway on Terra, thus allowing him a chance to kill the Emperor at last, instead, Gilliman allowed the battle to unfold above Terra, on its moon of Luna. There, the Primarch of the Ultramarines and the fallen Demon Prince of the Thousand Suns did battle with each other as their legions clashed all around them. Despite his incredible sorcerous power, Magnus was not able to overcome Gilliman, who would stab Magnus through the chest, sending him reeling and retreating with his forces back into the webway. With the arrival of reinforcements from Terra as the Solar Fleet and the Adeptus Custodes rode to their aid, the Loyalists were victorious, and the Ultramarines were able to see off their foes in the Thousand Suns Legion. There must have also been countless other smaller battles between the Ultramarines and the Thousand Suns across the events of the Scouring and the post-heresy era of the Imperium, but the battle that would take place starting on Avarax and ending on Demirium would be one of the most recent conflicts. It is this conflict that you see play out in Space Marine 2, a conflict that began long ago on the Forge World of Gryar, with an artifact of chaos, an Inquisitor named Drogon, a Chaos Lord named Nemeroth, and an unyielding captain of the Ultramarines known as Titus. Now Titus faces a new challenge, a threat known as Imura, one of the many sorcerers of the Thousand Suns Legion, one who has been blessed by Sinch with many gifts. And as the shadow of Titus's past comes to haunt him, there is a battle that the Ultramarines will see play out once more between themselves and the Rubric Legion of the Thousand Suns. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, go ahead and remember to leave a like and leave your own thoughts down below in the comments section. At some point in the near future, I do also hope to make a video covering the Tyranids, something which is a more general overview and something which hopefully is not going to be as long as this, but then again, maybe it is something you enjoy. And if it is, hey, I'll keep trying to make this stuff as long form as it gets. I do like to cover things in detail, so who knows, maybe that'll be a three hour video. All that being said, if you want stories from other universes, both near and far, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership, as always, is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Parodasia Ad Astra. I'll see you, Starside.